Greetings! Welcome to the CMP1002 of Grant Programming with C++ video series. In this series, we will cover object Grant Programming, its general concepts, general ideas and design concerns, as well as its implementation in the C++ language. In this video, we will talk about general programming concepts, programming paradigms, as well as talk about the key parts of object Grant Programming. Let's start by looking at some general programming language paradigms and concepts. And to understand those concepts, we have to first go to the early ages of programming or computer science in particular. And in those ages, as you might be imagining, as you might know, there are very huge sized computers like the one that you are seeing in this picture, like the ENIAC. So these computers are not only very big, but programming to these computers are very, very cumbersome. How cumbersome, you can say? Well, you have to know its machine code in order to program something to that particular machine. So this machine code is, as you can see, the thing that the computer understands. So this is just some hexadecimal numbers. And then you are supposed to know the meaning of every single one of these hexadecimal number couples. When you know these things, then you can just let them do, let the computer do some addition, multiplication, things like that. But as you might imagine, this is not a very fancy way of writing down a program. This is very inefficient, and it is generally very difficult for an actual human being to memorize every single potential command and use it in a very effective way. So the programmers in those ages, like the, like the ones that you are seeing here, Francis Bilas, Jean-Patrick, or people that come after them, they, after a while, started to think about what other things we can put, put on top of this machine code. And then after a while, they come up with the assembler languages. In the assembler languages, the command and the parameters of every single command is very clearly separated. And now you don't need to just have this hexadecimal to the actual what does it mean relationship in your mind. You don't have to memorize those things. Instead, every single command has a specific name and you are supposed to know the name, like what does the move L does, add L does, XOR L does, and every single one of them, how many parameters there are, and what is the purpose of every single parameter. For example, in this particular one, the second line, add L, E, C, X, E, D, X. So he's adding the values of these two variables and putting it in one of them, but whether it be E, C, X or E, D, X, honestly, I don't know, but you just look at the manual of that particular hardware's assembler, and then you just understand which one of them is the destination and which one of them is the second parameter, the source. And uh, note the fact that I'm saying this is uh, an assembler of a particular hardware, because assembler languages do change from hardware to hardware. And it is even today, it is like that. So nowadays, we also call these assembler or these kind of languages low level languages. And these languages basically correspond one to one to a machine code. So every single command that you write in these kind of languages have a one-to-one -one relationship with a particular piece of machine code. And the assembler programs are translated into machine code by a program that is called an assembler. But after a while, assembler and these kind of low-level languages start to become, again, cumbersome and hard to master. And then people come up with more sophisticated, more human understandable uh, languages whose structure look more like human languages start to pop up. The ones that we know today, like the Java, C, C++, Pascal, Golang, all of these fancy languages, these are go into the second category, which is called the high-level languages. Each one of these languages has its own standards, or multiple standards in some of these cases, and each one of these languages have their predefined instructions. These high-level language instructions are translated into machine language by generally another program, which is called a compiler. And in contrast to assembler, they generally do not have a one-to-one -one relationship with a machine code. So every single line that you are writing in, for example, Java, may not necessarily just boil down to a particular machine code. The compiler have a way of translating your whole program into a group of, a collection of machine code pieces based on the logic, the design choices uh, that has been defined uh, or configured in the compiler. Today, when we look at the general world of programming languages, you'll be noticing a lot of languages. Some of them are more obscure, some of them are very well known, some of them are old and, well, not very well known anymore. 
Some of them are particular features which are good in a particular field of study, others are more general languages. The first paradigm of interest that we will be looking at in terms of high level languages is a compiler versus interpreter. How does your language approaches to handling the source code? When talking about high level languages, I mentioned a particular program called a compiler. So the compiler's job is basically taking the program written in that particular high level language and then translating it as a whole into the machine code. So noti notice the fact that I'm underlining this concept as, uh, as a whole here, because the compiler checks the, all of your code as a single entity and then optimizes it and then finding it the ideal way of changing it into a machine code. This is not the only way that you can handle your source code. You can handle the source code of a high-level language. Some other high-level languages use an, another program called an interpreter. While the compiler takes the program as a whole, interpreter takes, e uh, takes every single command and then translates or interprets every single command into the machine code one by one. So in this particular example, when I say print hello world, he, the interpreter, simply takes that command and then converts only that command into the machine code. And then that code is now being executed over the machine. And it's just going to be continued with the second command and the third one and the fourth one and it will go on and on like that. Whereas in the compiler based solution, the compiler will take the whole program and then he will try to weed out unnecessary parts if there are and he will try to say, ah, how should I be converting it into machine code? Should I use this particular command or that particular command? Are some branches of this program unnecessary? So he can have a general look at your program and then he can find inefficiencies and then take them out. So if you are aiming for efficiency, a compiler is super nice because based on the configuration that you have set up to the compiler, it will generally have a very, very efficient uh, machine code uh, counterpart. However, interpreter has another benefit. Interpreter is generally not good for efficiency. In contrast, interpreter is good for portability. Because the thing, the problematic thing regarding the compiler is the output of the compiler is a machine code over that particular machine, which may or may not be that efficient if you move that code, if you try to run that code in another machine. It may even be incompatible. In the interpreter-based solution though, since this every single line is going to be uh, uh, is going to be translated one by one, it's going to work regardless of the hardware. So if the aim is for portability, interpreter is a very good choice, but if the aim is uh, efficiency, then compiler is the best choice. For example, C, C++ are compiler-based languages, whereas Python and Perl are interpreter-based languages. A newer group of languages, mainly the Java and C Sharp, have a different approach, which is basically a hybrid of these two methods, a compilation plus interpretation, which the Java calls just-in-time compilation. How does it work? So you have the source code written in Java language. So again, there is a Java compiler, usually the Java, or you can use another thing though, which will just gonna take the code as a whole and then convert it into what is called a bytecode. But be careful this terminology here, bytecode. I didn't say that this is machine code, since bytecode is specific to the Java language. So there in this compilation process, all these efficiency-based things have been handled. So now you have an efficiently translated bytecode. But then this bytecode is now run over what is called a Java virtual machine, line by line, command by command, via an interpreter. The good advantage of this kind of approach is he's going to taking the efficiency advantage of the compiler and combining the portability advantage of the interpreter. How you might say? The Java virtual machine is going to be built on top of every single hardware, but how does a particular implementation of a Java virtual machine on hardware one or hardware two, it is not your concern. It is Java's concern and then they just do it. So all of your Java codes will be compiled into the same bytecode, whether it's being written on a 
Windows machine or a Linux machine or a macOS machine or whatever. So the same bytecode will be interpreted over the same Java virtual machine whose interface with the actual hardware is again none of your concern. So this is a bit of a best of both worlds approach, but don't get me wrong, still because of the interpretation parts, this is less efficient than the pure compiler based solution. But regardless, this is a very nice idea too, and you can argue that this is one of the reasons why Java and C-sharp is very commonly used today. Another key principle or paradigm you might say regarding programming languages is how does the type errors are being handled. Here there are two approaches, static versus dynamic typing. The code piece on the right hand side that you can see is the classical C++ way of writing down a little bit of function which takes two integer numbers, adds them up and then just returns the summation of these two numbers. On the left hand side you are seeing the Python counterpart. Notice the difference be between these two codes. In the Python version, I didn't write down the types of these num a, num b or the return type. Whereas in the C++ version, I explicitly say that num a is going to be an integer, num b is going to be an integer and the return type is going to be an integer. The first one, on the one on the left hand side is called the dynamic typing whereas you did, do not generally explicitly state like the type of this particular variable is this or that. You don't do that. Whereas on the second version, the static typing, you specifically explicitly state the type of every single variable. So the main advantage of dynamic typing is as you can see, you don't deal with different types of variables or you don't care about whether num a is double or integer or whatever. Whereas in the static typing, you explicitly have to deal with the type of every single variable here. So the int add ha should have a double add version, float add version, char add version. And if you are trying to add one integer and one double, one integer and uh, with one float, you have to write down versions of the same function over and over and over again, which can be very boring as you might imagine. Whereas in the dynamic typing, you don't have to do such a thing. You will just write down a single function and the compiler or the interpreter will just gonna decide what's gonna be the type of num a and num b based on the variables that you are passing to this function, which offers a high flexibility. And you are also adding more flexibility when you are working with arrays, whereas every single element of the array is of different types because in a classical C, C++ language, it's not gonna be possible. Whereas in a dynamic, uh, program, dynamic typing programming language, you will be able to have an array whose elements will be of different types. However, the dynamic typing will also introduce this type error kind of concept. So the thing is, you may, your code may not be written according to this addition of a double and a character. So what's gonna be happening? you will be facing errors in which cases which you didn't think about how to add these two particular types of variables. Whereas the advantage of static typing is since you explicitly state down how these two things will be added up based on their types, it is gonna completely eliminate the type errors at a cost of less flexibility. There is no right and wrong here, don't get me wrong. Both of these uh, typing uh, structures, paradigms will have their own advantages and disadvantages. A similar concept regarding typing is weak versus strong typing. Let's have a number which has an integer type and whose value is 53. So let's assume that for the sake of simplicity, this in this particular language and this particular hardware, this number is now kept as a 16-bit value. So the two approaches, strong versus weak typing, just focuses on are we going to be able to manipulate individual bits of a particular variable or the particular or a variable is an atomic unit so you can only deal it at an integer level. So in a strong typing uh, programming languages such as Java, this num can only be manipulated as an integer. So this is a one, en one entity and you cannot manipulate a particular bit of that num uh, integer uh, variable. However, in the weak typing concept, it allows the programmer to manipulate individual bits or bytes of the data in anywhere desired. So generally, weak typing is super nice when you are dealing with an embedded programming environment or a language that has been designed for optimized embedded programming 
uh, usage. However, strong typing is generally much nicer if you are dealing with more high-level applications such as a web programming and things like that. Besides these typing concepts, you have the general big paradigm, these two-dimensional paradigms, which every single one of these high-level languages just have uh, either procedural and uh, object-oriented or imperative and functional in these two axes. So let's look at the first part, the procedural versus object-oriented. Here you can also, or some people can also call it like the procedure programming are like the older concept, whereas object-oriented programming is like the more common, uh, more newer paradigm, which is a very arguable sentence if you ask me, honestly speaking. Uh, from a more technical perspective, a in a procedural uh, paradigm, you think about functions first, then you think about the data types. Whereas in the object-oriented, it's still vice versa. You think about the data types first, and then you look at the functions on these data types. So generally, the procedural programming, uh, procedural programming uh, code is basically like the steps the program should take to reach the desired state. It doesn't care that much about what are the main data types. It will generally be composed of several big size procedures which is like the f functions, but it is uh, for the uh, for some clarification reasons, the generally procedural is uh, used. Whereas in object-oriented programming languages, you organize the program as objects and define interactions between objects. So in the procedural, you mainly focus on integers, doubles, these kind of simple variable types. Whereas in the object-oriented, you think about more sophisticated uh, hypothetical concepts like a student, like a class, like a ship, like a desk, things like that. And then after declaring these data types, after deciding on which data types that you will be using in your particular program, you're gonna be defining the interactions be between these objects. A student can take a class. A ship can sail, can dock, can fire, things like that. So this is a very, that's why it's called a paradigm, conceptual difference here. Second axis in this paradigm discussion is imperative versus functional. Most of the languages that people use nowadays is an imperative language. So you can simply say like the common languages, most of them are object-oriented imperative languages. Well, but, but at the same time, you also have the functional languages and there are cases where the functional concept is a better fit. So in the imperative language, functions may have a state and it may not return the same answer to a given parameter value. So a function is not in like a mathematical function. So based on some state of the system or some state of that particular object or a class, the function may or may not behave the same way. But in the functional programming, a single function will always return the same answer given the same set of parameters, regardless of any state or anything like that. So it is more like a pure mathematical function, hence the name functional programming language. In the imperative, there will be statements in the code will, which will be changing the state of a program. In functional, the functional languages try to avoid having a state as much as possible. Ideally, they will have no state at all, which is, a, as you might imagine, super fundamental concept, but uh, functional programming languages also have some state generally, but they try to avoid it as much as possible. Most well-known programs and high uh, highly used languages are imperative languages. Uh, the functional languages, uh, they are like the Haskell and like the F-sharp, uh, things like that. They are similar in concept to purely mathematical functions. In last, I think like five to 10 years, some concepts from the functional uh, programming language, such as the, such as the lambda functions, the lambda concept, has uh, started to become useful in the imperative languages, and then uh, languages like Java, C Sharp, C++ has added these lambda functions concepts uh, borrowed from the functional programming languages, because those lambda functions are like functions uh, which returns the same answer given the same uh, parameter set, regardless of the state. So this is a very, very functional way of thinking, but original imperative functions d did not have such a thing. Lambda basically, basically uh, implemented that functionality. Before continuing, let's give a bit of a small coding examples from a functional programming language, the scheme language, a more commonly used functional programming language. 
So this is a basic addition operation in Scheme. So you always have these parentheses. Well, well function programming languages generally allow parentheses. And then you just write down the name of the function, which is the plus sign here. And then you just provide him with the parameters. So here the plus is the function name, basically speaking. And the six and five are the parameters of this particular function. So this is a very purely mathematical function, you can say, but this is a super, super simple function. A bit more sophisticated functions look like this. So in the first one, you are actually multiplying multiple numbers with each other. So it's going to be actually two times, three times, four times, seven. But you can all wrap things up, wrap every single one of these up with a single star sign and then give him as many parameters as you want. In the second one, you also have a division operator. But within the division operator, the second parameter is actually the outcome of another function, which is an addition function. So he will be using the mathematical precedence, operator precedence notations here. So the first two parentheses will be resolved. Uh, so the two and three will be added. And then the, the outcome of five will be uh, evaluated. And then six will be divided by five, one dot two. And then it's going to be divided by two, zero dot six. The more sophisticated examples are going to be eval are going to be uh, handled by this define keyword here. So you'll be able to define advanced functions based on simpler, smaller functions. So in this particular example, I'm just going to say square x. So this is the name of my function square. And that function will be having a single parameter x. And what is going to be the definition or the implementation, if you will, uh, of this particular square function is basically star xx, taking the square of a particular number. Then I can build on top of this advanced function another advanced function, which I'll be calling hypotenuse side one, hypotenuse side one, side two. How do I calculate the hypotenuse? Uh, it was gonna be the outcome of a SQRT, a square root function, and square root function will have a single parameter, which is the addition of two more parameters. Every single one of them will be the outcome of a square function. So as you can see, I'm actually linking up multiple mathematical, multiple simple mathematical equations together and then combining them to come up with a much more sophisticated and advanced mathematical function. The key thing here is that I did not declare any variable. Side one and side two are simple parameters. I didn't write down like an intermediary variable x has this one, y equals that, and do things like that. No. Some functional programming languages also allows variables, but generally you are trying to avoid defining any variable at all because variables have uh, variables lead to a state of the system, which the functional programming conceptually tries to avoid. After all this discussion, let's try to compare these a couple of very well-known languages. First of all, C versus Java. C is, as you might know, a compiler-based language. Whereas the Java, as I mentioned, is a just-in-time compiler-based languages. Both of them are static typing languages, in both of which you have to specifically say this is a, this variable is an integer, this variable is a char, etc., etc. C is a weak typing language, which allows you to manipulate individual bits of whatever type you use in your variables. Whereas Java is a strong typing language, so every single variable is atomic, so you cannot uh, deep, uh, dig deeper and you cannot change individual bits of any variable that you define. Both of them are imperative languages, but C is a procedural language and Java is object-oriented language. I think some people can argue this, uh, uh, this claim that C being a procedural language. You can technically, to the best of my knowledge, if you push it, you can technically convert C into an object-oriented programming language. However, I think this is going to be a bit of str stretch. Therefore, I am I feel like I'm safe uh, when calling C a procedural language. If we compare the C++ with Java, then the first couple of lines is going to be the same. However, C++ and Java they are both object-oriented uh, programming languages. Again, don't get me wrong. Any object-oriented programming language can be used as a procedural language, but the thing is they are not limited to this concept, let's say. They have the class concept, whereas a uh, procedural language don't have the main, main class and object concept. Okay, after giving this general overview about uh, different 
categories, different features, and different paradigms of programming languages. Let's go and look at main building blocks of the object-oriented programming language from a conceptual point of view. Here, I'm not going to be talking about the implementation or the C++ implementation or Java implementation. I'm going to talk about the conceptual things, but while giving examples, obviously I'll be giving examples over the C++ language. So, I mentioned that the key concept here is data before action. So in any object-oriented programming language, whether it be a pure object-oriented programming language like, like Smalltalk, or an object-oriented programming language with a little bits of hints of procedural like Java and C++, you will have a class concept. This is going to be your data type definition, and this is going to be considering a hypothetical thing. But it is not going to be, a class is not going to be a thing, it is going to be a definition of a thing. So it's like a blueprint of a building, not the building itself. So a class definition will have generally multiple fields, which are called uh, variables. They can be of different classes or th they can be simple data types like the integers, doubles, floats, and chars, and such. But the, a class is not going to be limited to fields only. You will be all able to also declare functions over classes. These functions will be doing something generally on top of the fields of that particular class. They can access fields of other classes, but they are generally be uh, defining uh, some actions uh, made over the fields of that particular class. Here, I will be calling an object of class X when I make an actual object out of this class. So remember, like the class is like a blueprint of a building. An object is like an actual building. So this thing will have a val value for every single one of these fields, and it will have all the functions that you have declared for that class. So you will able to have different objects. Some of these objects will be derived from the same class. Some of these objects will be derived from other classes. And some of these functions of, let's say, object B of class Y will be able to access uh, as function of object A of class X, which may in turn, uh, or another function may in turn manipulate the v value or change the value, or just simply read the value of a particular field in the same object. So these arrows will be the actions, the interactions either between uh, different uh, objects of different classes, or interactions over a function of a particular class over some of its fields. Before continuing, I have to explicitly define the state concept in here. Because object-oriented programming, when you are talking about an object, you have to specify like there's going to be a state of an object. Remember the fact that we are always talking about imperative object-oriented programming languages. Technically, there can be uh, functional object-oriented programming languages, but to the best of my knowledge, there is either no such thing or something that might be very obscure, which very few or no people actually uses. So therefore, there's going to be in many, many common cases, let's say, a state in an object-oriented programming language. Let's look at object A of class X. And let's say that this uh, class, any object of this class, is composed of three fields and three functions. At a given time t, let's say t equals 1, the, first value of the, uh, the, the value of the first field of object A is going to be 6, the second field's value is going to be capital A, and the uh, value of the third field is going to be 34. So if you look at the same object, let's say at time equals 8, something has happened, and the value of the second and third field, third, uh, second and third variable have been changed. So the box actually states the boundaries of the object, and the inside of that boundary may change from time to time. So this is going to be the state of the object. Why do we care, you might ask? Because some of our functions may behave differently according to the value of the second field or the third field, or maybe it can be something like if the uh, summation of the first and the third field is more than 50, function A look works like that. If this is less than 50, function A works in a different manner. So the functions will be able to and will generally work according to the state of that particular object or according to the state of multiple objects. 
Another key concept regarding object-oriented programming language is, uh, languages in general is encapsulation, or in more layman terms, information hiding. So let's say we have this object A of class X and we have a couple of different objects of different classes. So one can ask this question like, who, which one of these objects and which one of the functions of these objects should be able to access, read, and or change the value of field two of object A of class X? A very simplification of this uh, answer can be only the functions of that class should be able to manipulate or even read the value of that field. It's not going to be a general case. You will be able to allow some of these fields to be able to manipulate it or simply read from the outside. But the key idea here is we will have a control over who should be able to check what, which one of these fields, who should be able to only read it or change it or read and change it. In many cases, you can say like uh, a function of a class uh, should only be able to change the value of the field of another class through the class's function, like the red arrows that you are seeing in this slide. Another common feature is going to be the inheritance concept, which can be summarized as the common features between classes. This is like the inheritance keyword in regular day-to-day -day life, but you are not inheriting something basically from your parents or your grandparents, something like that, but something similar. Let's look at this example, a medieval merchant. We are trying to write some program in which we have a data type called a merchant, a medieval merchant. So this guy will have a name, most likely, will have a height, will have a shop because he's a merchant, and he will have an age because he is actually a human being. He will have, let's say for the sake of simplicity, a couple of functions. He is able to walk, he is able to trade with other people, he is able to eat, and he is able to sleep because, well, he is a human being. At the same program, I can say, let's have another class called Sultan, or a king. The Sultan, or king, will also have a name, and will also have a height, and will also have an age. But the Sultan slash king will have a kingdom, or a Sultanate, or emirate, whatever you want to call it. That person will, be, will also be able to walk, will be also able to eat and sleep, but he will also be able to declare war on other countries, other duchies, other empires, whatever. He will also be able to rule over his kingdom, his sultan, his emirates. So you might be seeing some uh, common items here in both of these classes, like the name, height, and age are actually common among these classes. Similarly, some of these functionalities, walk, eat, sleep, is also common functionalities among these two classes. So the inheritance concept simply says that you can actually declare uh, another class, for example, let's call it person or a human class, which will have these common features, name, height, and age. And this person is now able to walk, sleep, and eat. A sultan is a human. So Sultan will inherit all the features, all the fields and all the functions that you have declared in this class person because Sultan is a person. Sultan is a human. In addition to being a human, being a regular human, a Sultan will have a kingdom, a Sultan will be able to rule his kingdom, and Sultan will be able to declare war other, uh, against other uh, well, countries. Similar to that, a class merchant is also a human, a merchant is also a human, and he also have everything uh, that a regular human does. Additionally, he has a shop and he's able to trade. So this moving common features between classes into some shared uh, subclass, or I would be calling, I think in a correct terminology, a superclass, is one of the uh, founding uh, blocks of object-oriented programming language concepts. A third thing, which of uh, another importance, is the polymorphism concept. Again, some more fancy words, which basically says classes sharing a common function, but these functions have different implementations. Let's have another, uh, this kind of inheritance relation, uh, let's form up another inheritance relationship. There's going to be a class naval ship, which is going to be the base class, I would call the super class, which will have the model, height, crew, and it's going to be able to sail, fire and dock because it's a naval ship. Then we will have three child classes, submarine, 
destroyer and galley. Each one of them will be able to sail, will be able to fire, will be able to talk. But the thing is, when I talk about firing, a submarine firing is very different, if you can imagine, if you know, uh, than a destroyer at the firing, or a galley actually firing, because these are fundamentally very, very different types of ships. When I say a destroyer is uh, firing, actually most likely it's going to fire its cannons or it might launch a bit of a missile, things like that, or a depth charge, worst case scenario. A submarine, on the other hand, most likely will shoot a torpedo, whereas a galley, uh, most likely the galleys don't have any uh, armaments at all, instead they have some people on, on their board and they are just shooting up some arrows. So, as you can see, the fire function will have different implementations based on the child classes. But the thing is, the nice thing is, I will be able to declare an array of the base class, as you can see here, naval ship, turkey ships 10. So this is an array of naval ship of size 10, and I just said like the zeroth item of this array is a destroyer, the first one is a submarine, whereas the second one is a galley. But when I say turkey ships 0.fire, it's gonna be calling the destroyer's fire function. Whereas when I say Turkish ships 1.fire, it's gonna call the submarine's fire function, which is gonna be fundamentally different from each other. But as you can see here, I didn't say like uh, just call destroyer's fire function or submarine's fire function. No, I did not say such a thing. So based on the class architecture and the polymorphism system, the language and then the compiler will understand which one of the implementations of the fire function he should be calling. And as you might be seeing in the upcoming parts, it's going to be a very, very flexible thing to do. Okay, so we talked about general programming language concepts, we have given a couple of examples and we looked at some key things that differentiates different languages among themselves. We also looked up uh, several key concepts of object-oriented programming languages in general, and then we tried a bit of an example regarding the C++ implementations of these features. Note that these concepts are concepts, and implementations of these concepts will and uh, may or will uh, ch uh, change uh, depend on the particular language, like the C++ or Java will have a different implementation of inheritance concept, for example. In the upcoming parts, we'll be start looking at the class and objects concept, and then we will be looking at the class and objects implementation in C++ language. Thank you for listening, and see you in the next part.